Welcome to week 3's second lecture. So we are looking at the intertemporal choice problem. The intertemporal choice problem is given as follows. So you have incomes for the two periods, M1 and M2, and you have consumption prices, P1 and P2. You can think of these prices as a cost of a bundle of commodities. What is the most, we basically have to figure out what is the most preferred intertemporal consumption bundle? So uh, this is basically an allocation of consumption for the current period versus consumption for the second period. So what do we need in order to figure uh, this? Uh, figure the most preferred intertemporal consumption bundle? One, uh, we need preferences, and two, uh, we need the budget constraint the intertemporal budget constraint. All that we learned about the future value and present value in the first lecture is going to be used while we figure out what is the intertemporal budget constraint. So to start, let's ignore price effects for now. Uh, let's say that uh, P1 is equal to P2 is equal to $1. So you basically have to just think about uh, the cost at uh, the cost of the bundle at dollar one. Uh, we can think about uh, the prices later. So how does that uh, help us? So let's see. Suppose that the consumer chooses not to save or to borrow. Then what will be consumption uh, or what will be consumed in period one? Well, if he is not going to save nor going to borrow, then he basically consumes everything that he uh, has in the first period, which is M1, and therefore C1 would be equal to M1. Similarly, what would be consumed in period 2? That would be C2, which would be equal to the total amount that is available in period 2, that is M2. This gives us uh, what we call as the endowment point, which is given to you as uh, this green point here, or the green dot. So C1, C2 is equal to M1, M2 is the consumption bundle if the consumer chooses neither to save nor to borrow. Now suppose that the consumer spends nothing on consumption in period 1, that is C1 is 0, and the consumer saves everything. So uh, his total money income, M1, is going to be his savings. You must have guessed it right. We are trying to figure out the intercepts on each of the axes. So when we assume C1 is equal to 0, we are trying to figure out what is going to be the intercept on the y-axis. The interest rate we uh, have been given to work with is given by this small r. So what, what will be the period 2's consumption level if all of period 1's income is saved. So let's see, period 2's income is M2. Whatever I saved in the last period, which was total of M1, that would grow at the rate of 1 plus R. So M1's future value, that is at the end or begin, uh, beginning of period 2 or end of period 1, is going to be 1 plus R into M1. And therefore, the total income available for me in period 2 to spend on the consumption goods, C2, is the income in period 2, which is given by M2, plus uh, the future value of savings in period 1, which is M1 into 1 plus R. So period 2's consumption expenditure is going to be equal to M2 plus 1 plus R into M1. So this is basically saying that if you do not consume anything at all in the first period, then this is what you will consume in the second period. So we got one intercept here. Now let's think about figuring out the intercept here on the x-axis. So for that, we will assume consumption in the second period is zero. So you essentially are borrowing everything against your second period income, and then you will spend the second period uh, just repaying it back. 
So how do we do that? Now suppose the consumer spends everything possible on consumption in period 1. So C2 is 0 now. So as I said, you will have to now basically borrow because the period 2 income is something that you get in period 2. But showing that you're going to get that income in period 2, you can borrow against it. Let that borrowing be B1. So only M2 will be available in period 2 to pay back uh, B1 amount borrowed in period 1. So M2 should be used to pay back the borrowing plus the rate of interest on the borrowing. So B1 into 1 plus R should be equal to M2. Or the other way around, B1 is equal to M2 divided by 1 plus R. So the largest possible period 1 consumption is going to be given to you by C1 is equal to M1 plus B1, which we have substituted by M2 divided by 1 plus R. So now we have uh, the second uh, intercept, which is given by the pink dot here. Now, once you join these three points, you uh, basically get the budget constraint. But notice this uh, consumption here uh, in the current period when you do not consume anything in C2. This M2 divided by 1 plus R is basically the discounted value of money income that you will have in the second period. So it is the present value of uh, M2. And therefore, this total M1 plus M2 divided by 1 plus R is nothing but the present value of income endowment. And M2 plus 1 plus R into M1 is going to be the future value of the endowment. So the concepts that we learned before are going to come handy uh, while we figure out how to work with this budget constraint. All right, let's go ahead and uh, figure out uh, how we are going to work with this budget constraint, figure out the slope. Uh, let's assume a positive amount is saved. So M1 minus C1 is going to be greater than zero. Then of course, the period uh, two consumption would be whatever is the saving uh, during the first period, uh, the total amount which grew with the interest rate therefore multiplied by 1 plus R and plus the period 2 uh, income. So once I solve this uh, equation uh, for C2, then I can see that, uh, so what we have basically done is we have separated the terms C1 and M1, and then we have put C1 separately and M2 and M1 uh, together. Okay, so uh, that gives a convenient representation because our budget constraint is drawn in C2C1 space. Our preferences are also going to be drawn in C2C1 space. So to have this straight line format uh, is convenient. Therefore, the slope is going to be minus 1 plus R. So uh, what it essentially means is that you trade consumption of one period for the other period at the rate of the slope, at the rate of the interest rate. When would you be borrowing and when would you be saving? A person would be a borrower if he decides, he or she decides to consume more than what his income, his or her income is in the first period. So all the points to the right hand side of the screen endowment point are the points that belong to a borrower. All the points to the left hand side belong to the saver because you can take any point and you will see that you are saving at least something from the current period. All right, I suggest now you do the second quiz before you go on to the third lecture.